Okay, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mark Malcolmson. I have the huge honour and privilege of being the principal at City Lit, and I'd like to welcome you to this lunchtime City Lit Perspectives event. Um, about 18 months ago, we decided as part of our centenary celebration that we would ask um, various of our famous kind of contacts, people who know us well, fellows, um, to come and talk to us about um, an important topic uh, that matters to society at the time. Um, we had Grace and Perry do one in person at the Guildhall um, a year last summer, which was a great success. And we had a number scheduled for this year that were going to take place in various venues around London with our friends at the British Museum and various other places. Obviously, a number of those went on hold. But what we decided to do during the, the first stages of the pandemic was to take them virtual. And um, we had Sir Vince Cable talking about uh, the economy in the early stages of the pandemic. We had Ruby Wax talking about um, mental health and well-being during this very difficult time. And um, now that we're entering a kind of second lockdown, we are delighted to welcome our, our, one of our most recent fellows. City Lit has a very esteemed group of fellows, people who contribute to adult education in society and people we like to honor and acknowledge. And um, I'm delighted to welcome De uh, Professor Dame Mary Beard. Um, she is the face of modern classics in the world. Um, the reason that literally hundreds and hundreds of you have signed up to this event is because she is so well known. And for us, over the course of the next 55 minutes, we're going to have a chat. Um, it gives you an opportunity to ask a few questions. I'm going to start off with some questions that have kind of come in early. But then if you use, I would, it would be helpful, just so you know, that you have an option of the chat box and the Q&A, so that I'm not juggling between both. Um, if you could use the Q&A, what we'll try and do is um, I'll look for individual questions, also themes that come up. If you could keep them short, because I'm trying to ask questions at the same time as read, and um, but that will be great. So anything that you have that you'd like to ask, because obviously we can't do it in a normal theatre fashion, um, that would be the great way to do it. Um, we um, would like to thank our interpreters, and we also have closed captioning for um, anybody who needs that. If you press the closed caption button at the bottom, it gives you an opportunity to have those come up. So also, the event is going to be recorded, and we will be putting subtitles um, on the event afterwards. So that gives people an opportunity um, for our deaf community to be able to share with the event as well. But as part of Lifelong Learning Week. This is uh, the culmination of Lifelong Learning Week. We've had a lot of events all around the country and our colleagues at the Festival of Learning um, came to us and sort of said, would we be able to find something that would be fitting way to end? And I, I can't think of anybody better. So without further ado, Mary, first of all, thank you. And thank you for being part of um, this today. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's, it's great to be joining you all. Well, let me start, and I've got a few contextual questions. We're going to talk really about how classical cultures have affected society today, but I'd, I'd want to take you back. <laughs> you, know, you, you, what, what made you interested in classics? What, what first gave you that? Well, if we go right back, we go right back to when I was five. Um, I lived in Shropshire and my mum thought when I was five it was time that I saw London and so we went on a little holiday to London and we went to the British Museum and uh, there were two things that really struck me in the British Museum. One was the Parthenon marbles. We went to see sculpture from the Parthenon. I'm not sure I really knew what it was. Um, I'm sure I didn't know what it was but I still remember thinking how amazing it was that people so long ago could be so brilliant. You know, I'd kind of, I'd somehow grasped a very crude version at the age of five that, you know, of human progress throughout time. And yet here was something from thousands of years ago that was just brilliant. And that stuck with me. But perhaps even more striking for me, although it was about ancient Egypt, not about the Greeks and Romans, was that we went and saw the mummies and then we went to see 
the uh, everyday life in Egypt. And back then, this was 1960, and the British Museum was not child friendly. You know, the cases were high, and it was all, for, you know, a little bit forbidding, actually. And my mum, who was a school teacher, she'd, she'd seen at the back of one case, she's seen a little bit of carbonized Egyptian cake, you know, 4,000 years old. And she said to me, God, it's a bit of a gyp real Egyptian cake. And I thought, oh, I must see that. You know, just must, must see that. But it was at the back and she got bags and she tried to lift me up so I could see this cake at the back of the case. And it was all terribly awkward. But at that moment, a bloke came along and, and he kind of looked at us and he said, was there something I particularly wanted to see? It was kind of <laughs> clearly having trouble. And I said, yeah, that bit of cake at the back. You know? And he got some keys out of his pocket. He opened the case. He got the cake out. Oh, you know, this was bliss. And he just, you know, he didn't let me touch it, of course, but he put it right in front of my nose. And that was hugely important to me because not only the idea that the past was there in all its kind of domestic, you know, detail, you know, you, you could, there was such a thing as Egyptian cake still surviving, but also this idea that he was this guy, he'd open a case for you. You know, if you wanted to find out about the past, there were people there who'd help you. And that has very much for me been a kind of motto of mine. That, that bloke, I'm sure he's long dead, no idea who he was, but it, he somehow kind of made me think that, you know, opening cases to people is really, really important. So I think that's where it goes back, honestly. Oh, God, that's such a brilliant story. Um, and actually, that man doesn't realise what he unleashed. Um, if he even <laughs> is around today. That's, that's, I mean, that's the joy of adult education for us, is that it, allowing people to experience something that they might not have had the opportunity to do otherwise. So you studied classics at school? Did you do it in a traditional yeah. kind of... Very, very traditional way. Um, yeah, I did Latin and Greek at a single sex girls school. Um, and I, I enjoyed it partly, I have to say, because I was, you know, in that kind of teenage way, I was good at it, you know, and when you're good at something, you kind of invest in it. And it, so it kind of spirals. But I, I never lost my interest in archaeology. And that's what I was really what gripped me first. And we lived near quite a few Roman sites. And, you know, in my late teens, it would be difficult to do this now. But then um, I went on loads of archaeological excavations, um, which my I was an only child. And my mum and dad thought this was, you know, frightfully proper way of spending the summer holidays. I thought it was great to be with all these other young diggers on a campsite, you know, sex and goodness knows what. Whoops, no, not really. But, you know, it was kind of like a, a teenage holiday camp. Um, but your parents thought you were doing something good. <laughs> so... You know, Where were you going on those kind of digs? Were you travelling over to Italy and Greece or was it mostly No, it was all about 10 miles from home. <laughs> so, um, so it was largely in Shropshire. Um, you know, I occasionally uh, made it to Gloucestershire to do a Roman villa there. But it was, you know, I, I, it was very much, um, you know, the, what I now think, you know, is slightly, sometimes slightly, I shouldn't say this, a bit, you know, dreary, very few walls, uh, you know, and a few coins. At the time, you know, I, I still think, you know, you know, actually digging up even little scraps of pottery, which nobody has touched for 2000 years, you know, you know, they can look a bit unimpressive, but heavens, it's exciting to do it. Yeah, yeah I grew up um, only child as well. I grew up very close to Chester. And um, every so summer holiday I used to go, they, they got half an amphitheater yeah. um, because the other half is under a car park. And I just remember kind of being so excited by this thing that you could go and run around. Again, there's, there's that certain thing that you point about your piece of cake but also those things, the tactile nature of being allowed to <laughs> roam around in it, climb over things. Yes. There's something incredibly joyous about that that makes it come alive. I think that, and I think that, um, I, I think we've got a bit, a bit too careful about what we allow ourselves to do with antiquities. I mean, obviously, uh, it's important to look after them properly. You know, there's, there's no doubt. Um, but 
you know, if you ever appear on telly and you're not wearing rubber gloves, you know, uh, when you're touching a bit of the ancient world, you, you know, that's what I get more complaints about <laughs> than anything else. And, you, and I think that some things, you know, carbonized cake or leather shoes, you really don't want to get your perspiration on them. That would be dangerous. But you can pick up and throw around a Roman gold coin, as long as you can find it again, and can do it almost no harm. And I think that I feel very sad that, that people feel that they can't directly engage with ordinary bits of antiquity that are 2000 years old, because that is what's so exciting. You know, some things have got to be off limits, but other things, it don't matter. And you go to Rome now and you see, you know, upturned column capitals that we would have, you know, fenced off, right? You know, there are people eating their packed lunches on them uh, and it doesn't really hurt them. And, you know, I, I feel that we can go too far in making the past sort of off limits in a sterile area. Some of it's got to be, but not all. Yeah, and that leads me on to actually a really good point, which is is the the there is a little bit about the classics, which is kind of dubbed as the liberal elite. It's it's a very middle class thing, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things I think you've done a, a marvelous job is is to make it come real. I mean, whether you know. And, and that's from an academic point of view, making it more accessible. What's your thoughts about the, the, the kind of the Madeline Miller, Stephen Fry, Pat Barker, um, Robert Harris have done a lot about in that blend of fact fiction, think it like, do you think that's a good thing or? Yeah, hugely, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sure that we could all get together and find some absolute rubbish novels about the Roman world that we would be embarrassed even to open, right? But you know, all the ones that you've mentioned, uh, you know, it's part of a long tradition that's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years of kind of reworking the ancient world for ourselves, you know, and making it mean something in a new way to us. And I mean, I'm particularly interested in Harris because uh, I and his trilogy about the orator Cicero, because <laughs> I, I did my PhD thesis on Cicero. And when I look at it now, I think this is so boring. You know, what I did was so dull. And back then, if you said to people, oh, my PhD is on Cicero, even the word Cicero conjured up for people kind of a frightful stuffed shirt kind of in a toga you know pontificating you're know, just awful uh, and what Harris has done is he's brought Cicero to life with people you know so I now say um oh I you know when I did my PhD it was largely on Cicero people say oh god the Harris book is so interesting <laughs> so um I feel you know, really delighted. And I think it's, you know, great. And it's, it's not all, it doesn't all have to be really high, 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 high brow. I mean, you know, one of my favourites is Lindsay Davis's Falco mistress, you know, yeah. you know, the, the Roman detective and his girl and, um, you know, kind of gumshoe in ancient Rome. And, you know, it, it just, you know, it, it breathes new life into the subject. And the subject is, well, has always been having new life breathed into it like that. You know, you know, the old book of Spartacus and the film of Spartacus, Ben, -Hur, you know, Ben Hur was a late 19th century bestseller and it was all about ancient Rome, the last days of Pompeii, you know. And I think that's right because these stories have stroked the test of time. People are just fascinated by them. I mean, you, you and I have obviously seen the Troy exhibition earlier this year at the British Museum, which I just think was magnificent. And what was lovely was for those of people who didn't get to see it, it was the first way you walk down is, is all the artifacts and the history, et cetera, et cetera. And then as you walk back and around, it's actually how Troy has become part of whether it's Brad Pitt's thighs, whether it is bits of art from the 19th century, it's just come alive. <laughs> Uh, what I thought was very interesting about that show is in some ways it was an answer to um, the question that you half raised about this all being, you know, a bit posh, 
a bit middle class white blokes who went to public school. And what you saw is that uh, the story of Odysseus, the story of the fall of Troy, they have been kind of reworked and reimagined in all kinds of different traditions. You know, so you get African American artists thinking about the Odyssey, Homer's Odyssey, as a as a kind of as a colonial narrative. You get Afro Caribbean poets who do their version of um, uh, of the whole tro Trojan story, and so you know, I think sometimes I you know. I don't want to remotely um, criticize our prime minister, but he he can sometimes uh, give the impression because people see him as a voice of classics and they think of it therefore as um, a rather conservative, rather posh boys subject, which might be interesting, but sort of not for me. Well, you know, I was the first person in my family to get a degree, you know, I didn't, you know, uh, you know I wasn't posh and, um, you know, I think that you can liberate classics from that very narrow class bound version of it. And I'm very happy that, you know, actually, occasionally quite happy that I've got a prime minister who knows Latin. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think there's there are downsides to that. And, you know, it, you know, it's a subject for everybody and actually everybody does know about it though they've kind of convinced themselves that they don't you know so if you go and do a sort of um you know a bit of vox pop about you know what do you know about the ancient world and oh i don't know anything i absolutely nothing you know and then you say what did you see the movie gladiator oh right you know what about asterix the gaul oh that's brilliant isn't it and you know tell me a bit more about gladiators where did they happen and people know loads but somehow they felt a bit frightened by it i think and i think that is that danger a little bit of it's the, the latin and ancient greek is the, the the languages that you learn if you're at a posh school you know yeah. it's that rarefied atmosphere but actually i mean i did latin for four years at school i don't think i was very good at it but what i loved about it was actually the stories I wasn't very, I'm not very good at languages, but actually the underlying stories were so damn good. Where, you know, at 11, starting reading about Pompeii and the last days and how the family followed, that's that's making it come alive. And they're, they're and, you know, and it's being reinvented, but, you know, I think it's, it's always been, uh, been being reinvented. People often say to me, um, gosh, you know, you have done so much for really putting classics back on the map. Well, maybe I have a lot of other people have too. But if you if you go back to when I was a kid, there was old Mortimer Wheeler going around the Roman Empire on telly, I mean, sitting down and now slightly old fashioned way, puffing on his pipe, but explaining about ancient Rome. And there were, we used to read these kind of popular biographies by people like Michael Grant. And we watched I Claudius in the seventies, you know? So it, it, people always think that somehow the current generation has rescued classics. Literally every generation has rescued classics, sort of for itself. Yeah, and I think back to my dad, you know, the Ben Hurs, the Spartacuses, all of those Hollywood blockbusters of the 1950s, they were hugely popular. Um, I mean, it's interesting for me to see that they, um, there's a lot of controversy around Gal Gadot being classed as Cleopatra. Um, whereas, of course, Elizabeth Taylor, the, that film nearly bankrupted a whole movie studio. It ran over so right. but no, That's right. So it's this idea that it's suddenly a bit new. As you yeah. say, every generation's kind of engaged in classics in a different way. And there's probably little fallow periods. And then it takes somebody like you and the Stephen Fry's to kind of make it popular. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the, the just books that have been written, I mean, you've concentrated mainly on the nonfiction side. And obviously, you're a great scholar. <laughs> Are there, are there, have there ever been a temptation to kind of go, oh, I'd want to take that and make a novel out of it? Absolutely never. I, I, I have no clue how you'd go about writing a novel. You know, I think, um, you know, what I've got is I've got, you know, I've got some data and I've got some arguments and sometimes I've got a, a pre-existing story that I want to retell. And I think, what an 
how on earth? I, I have total admiration for novelists. You know, you've got a blank laptop and you're going to end up with a book and it's all good, all good to come out of your head. <gasps> I'm, I'm stunned with admiration. <laughs> I'll never do it myself. Well, so we were just talking before we came on air that we we're talking about a book that you're going to um, you're in the process of working on, which was The Day in the Life of a Roman Emperor. And uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about that, because it, it sounded fascinating. Well, uh, this is the, the book which I, I, I've done about 2000 words of good biographies, you know, but in the end, um, it, it seems to me that a biography of a Roman emperor doesn't get you very far. Um, we don't have evidence at all for their childhood. We then have some wars and some anecdotes, and then the next emperor comes along. And although, you know, there are some monsters and some goodies in here, the uh, basically one Roman emperor is much like another. You know, they're, they're more like each other than they are different. And what I wanted to, to do is try to find a way of taking people inside that question and saying, so what did they do? You know, um, you know, in one of one of my visions of the Roman Empire was determined by the BBC I Claudius in 1976. You know, well, and I think that more or less goes for a lot of people, you know, that you imagine the Roman emperor's life, they're lying down on couches saying, you know, pass the grapes, Marcus, and every now and then they're going off and poisoning somebody. And, you know, I, I wanted to think, well, who keeps a show on the road? Who does the cooking? What was the palace like? You know, when the Roman emperor got up in the morning, what did he do? Well, actually, one of the things he did, it was a bit like being the queen. He had all his, or a cabinet minister, he had all his red boxes to deal with. And, you know, one version of the Roman Empire, of the Roman Emperor, and it's not, it's not a hugely glam one, is that actually he was a frightfully hardworking, rather dull bureaucrat. I mean, even Julius Caesar, according to one bit of evidence that we have, even Julius Caesar, um, was felt so busy that he took his letters, he took his correspondence uh, to the games with him. And he really annoyed the crowd because the crowd thought uh, that he was kind of slightly insulting them. You know, he was supposed to be joining in, watching the games, etc. And instead he was signing his letters. Now, it's a little vignette, which is so different from what we usually think but I'm trying to you know capture that and that's so that's really the idea of just as you say looking for common themes as well as actually bringing it to life you know all great biographers bring things to life by the anecdotes from the story and, and you've got I think there's also such a lot of evidence for emperors but also classical antiquity in general that the people often don't kind of incorporate into books for the general reader you know uh, there's one of the things we know about the first emperor augustus for example uh, we know it because um it was all inscribed on stone recording the case is that you know he ends up judging uh, the case from the town of Cnidos on the Turkish coast of some poor bloke who was killed by a chamber pot that had either fallen or been thrown out of an upper window above him. Now, you know, when we think of the Roman emperor, we don't think of him spending his time uh, uh, judging cases about people who sadly died because of a flying chamber pot. And, so, I mean, I think that, that one of the things you can do if you look at emperors is you start to see the Roman world from their point of view, all the people who came to them with their little problems. You know, there's another lovely one I'm looking at now, which is, which is recorded in a whole set of legal cases about a woman who had lent one of her animals to a neighbour uh, but then there was some sort of minor border skirmish in which this poor animal uh, was killed and nobody could agree whether she should be compensated or not. Now, you know, that's right down to real life problems in the Roman Empire and it goes right up to the emperor. You know? 
So, so that's, I mean, that's exactly the type of stuff that makes it real and makes it textual. Lots of people have been asking questions. There's a number in the, the, the uh, Q&A box, but also some that came in advance. Um, we're talking about how the, the, the Greek and the Roman cultures kind of have an effect on us today, not just in terms of storytelling, but in terms of models of government, historical parallels, etc. cetera. Um, obviously this has been a week about America. Um, and uh, I teach American politics at the college. And my favorite quote is um, Harry Truman, who's not necessarily known as a great orator, but he came up some cracking quotes over the years. And there is nothing new, but the history we are yet to learn. Um, and what what parallels are you seeing with with essentially the American empire at the moment? It's its, it's biggest level over the last 20 years with with either Greece or Rome. Where, where are the, the threads that you see? Well, I worry a bit about parallels because, I mean, I think there is a tendency, um, particularly for journalists, to think that the Roman Empire is a kind of great place for ready-made, off-the-shelf, um, either comparisons or solutions to our problems. Well, you know, actually, our world's different, and we're rather better at getting solutions, I think, than the Romans were. Thank God, you know, we, you know, we got more experience. But I think it, well, what what both Greece and Rome does for us, I think, is help us kind of contextualize and see our own issues differently and I mean I think elections which is really the theme of this week is a, is a very good um is a good case in point because if you were to go to fifth century BC Athens at the height of the Athenian democracy um they would think that elections were not very democratic you know if you really want a democracy what you should do is you you choose your you know, prime minister equivalent or whatever, you choose by drawing lots. You know, democracy is about total equality of opportunity. Uh, you don't have uh, an election in which just some people pour you know, millions of dollars or drachma or whatever. Um, that's a very, very elitist thing to do. So I think, uh, I mean, modern democracy is very, very hung up on the idea of elections. I mean, that is what, uh, that is what, in a sense, it, it centers. You know, that's you know, the ballot box stands for democracy. Well, go back two thousand uh, and a half, two and a half thousand years, and the ballot box stood for something much closer to privilege and oligarchy. You know, and it was drawing lots that was democratic. But I was looking this morning, thinking about um, the extraordinary spectacle of what we're seeing in the states at the moment you know quite uh, you know you know watching a, a a kind of electoral process which appears to be sort of in meltdown and then you know thinking back to um before the roman empire to the democratic republic of rome and you look at what happened there, they were always having elections, and they were always having electoral problems. You know, they were always saying, you know, he's been bribing, that's corruption. Somebody would come in just as the election was going to start. You know, this is real Trumpism, actually, and say, oh, I've heard a bad omen. This was, I heard a thunderclap. We can't go ahead. Um, I'm sure if Mr. Trump had got, uh, you know, knew about uh, omens and thunderclaps that's precisely the kind of thing he would be doing and, and, and in one wonderful case um there's a, a a magistrate in rome and a roman official who's conducting elections and they they vote by groups and he the, the first group come up with their vote and he doesn't like what they decided so he says go back and think again right um, now, that is, you know, people joke about the EU, you know, saying, or oh, you have a referendum and then if you, uh, uh, you know, if it goes the wrong way, then you're told to go back and think again. That has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. So I think it, it, it doesn't solve the problem. I'm not sure it's relevant, but it sort of contextualizes it, I think. And it, it shows us that our problems aren't always as new as we think they are. Well, and actually, that's the thing for me is, is I, I often find that, uh, you know, you are terrified by what goes on now. And then if you look at history, you go, 
oh, actually, not quite the same, but actually for the last couple of thousand years, they've been doing things. They had in America in 1824, a very contested election of where there was this and that and the other. And you know, 200 years later, we're still around, so it can't be that bad. So I think there are some times you can go, yeah. it's a bit of a karma, and then you are actually, to, everything calms down a little bit because you can see the context. Having said that, I don't think the next few weeks are going to be that calm, to be totally honest. But um, what uh, Harold Macmillan famously said that um, the British play the role of the Greeks to the American <laughs> vulgar Romans. Um, that was very well. Uh, and Harold Macmillan obviously has that certain element of white male privilege in the 1950s. But do you think there's a, a certain elements of the way that the two relation the relationships between Britain and America have, have got those parallels or do you think that was just a, a kind of quite a clever thing to say? I think it was quite a self-serving thing to say I mean um, and I think that as cultural and political sort of geopolitics changes you know over decades or centuries I think that there are lots of countries, nations, regions that have found themselves in that position. How do we how do we define ourselves in relation to the new kid on the block, America, Rome or whatever? And I think it's very tempting to say, oh, well, yes, OK, um, you know, they've got the firepower. We've got the culture. right? And Greeks certainly did that. And to some extent, the Romans believed them. Um, uh, and the Brits have done that, and it's it's always half true. And you know, what's our guess for the future? That the Americans will end up doing that to China, saying, oh, oh we've got a culture. <laughs> so I, I think it's I think it's a, an interesting gambit. And I think it's a way, it's one of the ways in which people readjust to different power structures. You know, they claim power of a different sort. We've got soft power, cultural power, you know, you've got real power. Right? You, um, if you were to say, you know, say Joe Biden does win later this week, if you tell it to say to him, if you took one emperor to look at as a good model, or for any leader for that point of view, is there anybody in particular that you say, well, actually, if you, you looked at that person and that person's skills and the challenges they faced, that, that's something that would, would, would have helped broaden their views. Is there anybody in particular that you kind of like? No, I don't. I don't think I like any Romans for a start. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think they're extremely interesting. You know, I, you, I wouldn't go to dinner with them if you paid me. Um, I, I think that. I suppose what I'd say is, you know, a bit like you've said um, about Truman that you'll you'll uh, you'll start to understand modern problems better. If you put them in a historical context, you'll be less worried about um, some things and perhaps more worried about others. But I think that I would say, despite the fact that it's, you know, American magazines are always full of uh, advice built on the Rome, um, I'd say, I want you to think about now, mate. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, you've got, you've got enough problems, uh, it, you know, as we have. It, you know, the world has problems it's got to look at afresh and anew but the more you you've got a hinterland in which you're aware of of the you know the how power corrupts or you know or you know the dangers of autocracy or uh, the dangers of populism you know the dangers of populism are as old as politics itself you know? um right back to fifth century greece and also, obviously, there's lots of comments uh, over the last week about the actual the, the influence of money in politics. You just mentioned it before, and that's that's as old as time. You know, the, the yeah. idea of right. I mean, Robert Harris does a wonderful job of talking about the the funding of votes in yeah. Um, yeah. in Rome during uh, Cicero's time. No, that's right. It's not new that you've got political action committees in the states made, earning billions of dollars for yeah. their candidates, yeah. and they, you know. Um, they have the same wry view about riches that that we often have and it's um there's one uh, really nice quote from the philosopher seneca um 
first century AD. And he says, he's talking about big crimes and little crimes. And he says, um, big criminals, um, well, big criminals go to the Roman equivalent of the House of Lords. Uh, you know, little criminals end up in court. <laughs> right? And the, the kind of, of issues about, um, you know, different sorts of privilege, they, you know, that's been discussed forever. And I mean, I say, I don't think you get this, I don't think you can kind of go to antiquity and draw out the solution, but you can certainly start to think about it differently. You can see other people have thought about it. And I think that is, you know, that's extremely important. And it's also, I think, I mean, the ancient world is rather important, I think, for us now because of issues about race. Because the, it would not be true, I think, to say there was no racism in the ancient world, quite. Um, there was certainly a lot of prejudice in the ancient world. But by and large, it was a culture that did not function in, you know, in any way uh, with a kind of that racist undertow that we have. And I think that makes it quite interesting because of the absence, because of the way it's not like us. And I, I think it's very interesting, or at least it jolts you out of yourself to say that um, the, the kind of the close connection in, in modern thought between uh, 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 race and slavery, you, if you say to an ancient Roman um, uh, described to me a slave, it would be a blonde German probably. And so you can, you, I think the ancient world is quite good also at sort of unseating some of the assumptions that we have. And so some problems it shows us are as old as you can possibly think. Other problems are different. And I think that's, so it's that combination of sameness and difference, which I think is really important. And that actually brings it, so obviously this has been a tumultuous year in many ways. Um, one of the things that has done is we're, we're in our second lockdown now. Um, the balance between individual liberties and the collective good and what we do to protect others, et cetera. And where do, where do my liberties, where are they being infringed? That's, that's a big debate that I think is probably, probably more now in second lockdown than it was in first. I yes. think a, a bigger consensus of, all right, let's, let's buckle up and do this first time. Is there anything that in terms of parallels around that kind of collective good from the ancient world that you, that you think would be, that, that this is, a, again, a debate that's gone on for millennia? So, well, I, mean, I suppose I'd go back to quite early Rome. And you see at least through the prism of the later Romans who wrote about it. So we have to be a bit careful. Um, the idea of, of the threats to collective responsibility, you know, the kind of, um, you know, the early, the early Roman people were divided rigidly into two classes, you know, the posh, the patricians and the plebeians. And, uh, basically, the plebeians had no rights, and they did a lot of the fighting. And so, you know, when the chips are down and Rome is threatened, not by pandemic, but by let's say invasion, then eventually, the plebeians say, "We're not going to fight, mate. You know, unless unless you let us in, we're not going to fight." And I think that you see those clashes about, um, you know. If you want people to be responsible, then uh, what, what are the conditions under which people can be responsible? Um, and some of the conditions are the sense that there is a basic equity that uh, lies behind responsibility. You know? And I think it's no accident that in the late 19th century, in the beginning of the, um, the British trade union movement, that they looked back to those struggles of early Rome and the plebeians saying, we're not going to fight for you guys unless you give us rights. You know, they saw that as class conflict and they, you know, they thought the Romans invented the strike. <laughs> um, and so 
that's not an exact parallel for now, but I think there is a kind of similarity that if we don't feel that we're all doing our bit, then um, we're not going to pull together. We're not going to do what we're told. And um, we, we're seeing that, aren't we? Yeah. And I mean, as, as this and we've we've seen as you talk about the, the struggles this this year over race, there are there are a lot of analogies around what what various societies have done in the past It's um, it's it, we, we tend to think and this goes to a slightly broader question, we tend to think of the classics as being the Greco Roman world. Uh, and that's been reinforced. If you look at the founding fathers in America, all the, yeah, yeah. the great buildings of Washington are all built in that neoclassical mm -hmm. style. Etc. What, what are the other civilizations we should be spending more time and effort finding out about? Where, where are the other ones? We, are we being too narrow by? Well, we're, we're being too narrow in all kinds of ways, but you know, I think I can defend the narrowness, but I think one needs to look the narrowness in the eye, really. And um, uh, I, I think an awful lot of people in the West are deeply um, ignorant is, is being a bit cruel, but uh, somehow the civilization of uh, the ancient civilizations of China don't, don't figure. Now, actually, the Romans and the Chinese were in contact a little bit. You know, they terribly misunderstood each other and you get some very, very tall stories um, in early Chinese literature of what they thought the Romans were like. And so I think that there's always a cost and a benefit to concentrating on some things. And I think that you know, for me, the depth of study into Greece and Rome and the way that has being part of a humanistic tradition you know, for centuries, that's very important. But I think you also have to say, it was a sort of joined up world. You know, the Romans traded with India. They, you know, they knew the Chinese. And they're also, they're getting their ideas. You know, Greece and Rome aren't hermetically sealed. You know, they're getting ideas from ancient Persia, from ancient Egypt. They thought of Egypt as a, as a culture of enormous influence and antiquity. So uh, I think that we, you know, we have to face up to the fact that it's, it's not just modern culture is more diverse than often has been paraded to, you know, within a traditional educational institution. But history was more diverse in all kinds of ways. And, you know, I think that ancient history has been uh, hugely enriched by looking at um, uh, the, the way Greco-Roman civilization interacted with uh, other cultures and the way you know Gilgamesh is a lot earlier than Homer <laughs> so you know it's not that the Greeks and Romans even got there first everybody now you know I I still uh, because I'm you know uh, I'm 65 old-fashioned girl and um you know I still think that uh, uh you know a lifetime spent reading Homer and Virgil is not a lifetime ill spent uh, and I think there's always more to find, but I think that uh, you you also have to look outside, and you have to say, you know, cultures don't exist in a vacuum. You know, it's you know, just look at what somebody, for example, like David Olashoga has done about Black Britain. You know, the, you know and entirely um, uh, undermining, you know, the, the I think rather pernicious myth that. Um, Britain only became a racially mixed country after the Second World War. You know, there, you know, there've been there've been blacks in Britain before there were English in Britain. You know, and you know, I think we need to jolt ourselves out of our of our conceptions that our historical world, as we see it, is as bounded, really was as bounded as we've tried to understand it. It wasn't. One question, a number of very good questions will be coming up. So I'm going to do, dive around a little bit at the moment. Um, one, one question which is very practical. I'm new to classics. 
if there's one book that I should read in your view, what, what would be that book to kind of get a good introduction into the world of classics? Oh God, well, that's, that's almost um, impossible to answer. I mean, what I think I would say is, um, if you're thinking of an ancient text, go and read Homer's Odyssey. Uh, there's loads and loads of translations, very good new one by Emily Wilson, first time translated by a woman into English. Um, uh, you know, go and just dive into, you know, as uh, the text that everybody in the ancient world sort of knew about, you know, and, you know, even if they hadn't read it. Um, um, I, I think otherwise, you know, this is, this is kind of very hard, but um, uh, if we're thinking Greece, Greece, I'd uh, pull cartilages books. Um, it's got a very nice one called The Greeks, um, where you know he just goes into uh, what somehow made the ancient the Greek world tick, rather than give you you know a, a, a chronological narrative of different phases. And I, I, so I would start I start with Homer's Odyssey and Cartilage the Greeks, and then Great. take it from there. <laughs> That's brilliant because what you want to do is just get a start. Just, just get a start. Yeah. yeah. No. Um, obviously, you've written on the role of women generally. Um, there seems to be a stereotype in most people's minds that in, in the, the ancient world, very few rights, very little power on society. Is that actually correct? Or, or does it change as time goes on during? Um, it's, I mean, broadly, it's correct. <laughs> I, I, I think you know, it, it, if you had to decide where to be a woman, uh, you certainly wouldn't choose classical Athens. Uh, um, Rome was a hell of a lot better on basic principles of rights. I, I think people then say, well, so, you know, how come you spend a whole lifetime studying this deeply sexist, misogynist culture? And I think it's because women are exploited and oppressed throughout, to a greater or lesser degree, throughout the ancient world. Partly connected with that, I think. Um, ancient culture, ancient writing, ancient art, ancient theatre is absolutely um, um, obsessed, is not putting it too strongly, with the idea of gender difference. You know, how do we understand the role of women and the role of men? Now, it's partly because oppressive cultures often start to reflect about the very nature of the oppression that they are um, party to. Uh, but I think that you see right across the board, uh, we, at, at, in the level of culture, the meta level, uh, you see some of the most sophisticated ideas of gender difference, sexual difference, um, uh, which I think makes it hugely rewarding. Now, you know, yeah, being realistic, you've got to say, and that's totally embedded in a culture where, uh, you know, to say that women have it rough is putting it mildly. I mean, it might, it probably was better for the poor um, than it was for the rich, you know, because it's only the rich that can afford to um, keep their women under lock and key. Um, ordinary, you know, people, you know, with their small holding in the country, uh, it's probably much more, uh, there's much greater equality of lifestyle but no you know I think it's it's only one of the reasons but is one why I'd never ever ever want to go back there. I mean in terms of of the various civilizations we go juxtaposition here between Athens and Sparta and Athens and Rome etc is the is the one that you think is 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 Better's probably not the right word, but you know, if you look at them and you look at them, actually, they 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 were nearer to being better than you. No, I mean, and I think that it's a very good case um, and instructive for us. Um, you know, we we tend now to have a, a a version of historical characters or historical periods that we kind of put on a range between really awful, not quite so awful, very good. And, you know, you can look in some of the, the recent culture wars, you, you can see people are wanting, when they're looking at individuals, to say they're either good 
or they're bad. Now, I think one of the things that you can see uh, if you take a kind of wide view of ancient history is that societies are complicated, they aren't either good or bad. Um, some might be better for, you know, for some people and not for others. You know, do we want to have a world in which um, the, you know, the tragedies of fifth century Athens never happened uh, and which we have no access to them? No, I don't want a world like that. But that was a world that was embedded in slavery, in exploitation, in misogyny. And I mean, I think the job of the historian is to get their head around the complexities of this um, rather than, and, and to see that simple evaluation is not possible. Now, I think that people often say historians shouldn't evaluate, of course they damn well should, you know, um, you know, the idea of, you know, looking back in the past and saying, you know, I, I, I don't intend to pass any moral judgment on uh, Nazi Germany, you know, no, of course we don't, we want to evaluate the whole time, but we've got to kind of make that evaluation part and parcel of, of a different set of issues about what is good, good for whom, um, what the costs of some of the things that we value are. You know? We started with you talking about your piece of cake at the British Museum. And one of the questions we got earlier was, you're a trustee of the British Museum, City Lit partners with the British Museum on a whole series of events. We're obviously almost neighbors in the West End of London. Um, What's your favourite artefact? <laughs> well, I, I'm not... The cake's sure. still around for that. The cake, the cake, the cake is still around, but um, uh, it doesn't have quite the same interest to me as it um, used to. Um, the one object that I'm very, very interested in, because its history is so complicated, is so-called um, Meroe head of the Emperor Augustus. It's one of the finest... Roman portraits in the world. It's a bronze head. It's still got its eyes, which makes it, you know, a lot of ancient statues can look a bit vacant, um, but uh, this Augustus has still got its eyes. So he kind of looks at you, engages with you. And it was a head that was probably, came from a, a statue, a full-size bronze statue, probably made in Italy. It was then shipped out to kind of plonk the figure of the emperor in the new province of Egypt, um, standing all proud and tall, it was then um, uh, the victim, I put victim in inverted commas, of a raid from the Meroitic kingdom in Sudan, who came up and um, chopped his head off. <laughs> God knows where the rest of the statue is, chopped his head off, took his head, back to their city of Meroe and buried it under the steps of their Temple of Victory, right? So it's a kind of great trophy. 2000 years later, almost, um, some nice, some nice archaeologists, you know, kind of colonial type archaeologists, we can all picture them from the University of Liverpool, go and dig up the city of Meroe and under the temple steps, they find the head of Augustus just where he'd been buried after he'd been raided and they take it back to Liverpool and then eventually to the British Museum. And I think that's, you know, that's a story which just encapsulates all the different levels of, of looting, of power, of raiding, of repatriation um, in, a, in a single object. You know, and people, it's great to talk to with, with students, talk about with students, because they say, I think it should go back to Sudan, they say, well, some do, and it's, it's not foolish. I say, but the Sudanese pinched it. You know, from, you know this, was, this was loot, this was war loot. But, so, so where should it go back? You know, if we think, and it's, it just raises those kind of really tricky issues about who owns what and why. You know, I, I, I just want to end with the, we're coming very much up to the hour now. 
um, of, of really a heartfelt thank you for this is over the last hour, I want to go and buy about 20 books. If Waterstones was open now, I'd be romping down to Chiswick. I'll, 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 you know, you, you communicate enthusiasm. I think great teachers, and I hope, you know, City Lit is renowned for having lots of great teachers, is great teachers have that ability not only to have the knowledge, but the ability to communicate and the ability to communicate with enthusiasm. You've kind of taken us through that over the last hour and I'm really inspired. I have my own suggestion for that person who on, on the question to ask what, what, if you want to read one book. <laughs> oh thank you for the advert Mark. <laughs> no, no, but I, I genuinely think it's, it's actually we talked earlier about kind of novelists and the novelized version and yeah Robert Harris and Madeline Miller are wonderful but actually if you want a cracking great history book um, this is it. This is, you know, if you only need one book to tell you about the Roman Empire, that's the one, in my view. Um, I, I kind of, it was last winter that I read it, and it was it was the bedside book. And so, Mary, I just want to thank you for what oh, you do you. for education. This is Lifelong Education Week. Thank you for coming and doing this online with us. Um, Obviously, in-person education has struggled enormously for lockdown, not just for the kids, but adults. There are many decades worth of adults who want to continue their education. I take huge pride in that we now have over 2,000 of our courses at City Lit online, and a lot of people are engaging on them. And you, know, you helping us do this and say, OK, it's different, it's not worse or better, but learning and education and, and communication and community is hugely important. And um, I, I pay huge tribute to what you do for us, Mary, and um, thank you for being part of the City Lake community. Thank you. thank you for being here for Lifelong Learning Week. And there is just thousands, of lovely, I'm gonna end with a quote which, I wish he'd been my Latin teacher. <laughs> so with that, everybody, the, the hundreds that have turned up today, Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Stay engaged with City Lit. Mary, our wonderful interpreters and our captioners. Thank you, thank you very much and um, stay safe and well. Thank, thank you. you thank you very thank you for having me. Okay. Oh, Bye. Thank you so Bye. Much. Bye. <laughs>